so hello and welcome to week five of Atheism for Lent. Congratulations if you've gotten this far. Uh, I do want to maybe do another little poll on WhatsApp and see, uh, see who has kept up. Um, as I've said before, you know, if you can't do every day, that's not terrible. You've got all the material. Uh, even doing three uh, in a week is, is pretty good. Um, although, as I say, don't, don't keep trying. Don't let me put you off doing everything. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to get your feedback. Um, you know, you're welcome to email me or stick into the WhatsApp group. Uh, stuff that you find, you know, if things were too much or too little, um, you know, how much material did you feel overwhelmed at times? I try to make sure that there's not too much uh, you know, most readings, I think, are between one and three pages, a few are a little bit longer. So I don't know, hopefully you're doing well. We are now over the hump, we're coming into the end, and things are going to change from here a little bit. So as you know, we've been doing the dialectic dance, the, the affirmation week one, the negation week two, the negation of negation week three. And then week three, that negation of negation is an affirmation, and week four is a type of negation. And now week five is the kind of negation of that negation, which becomes a new affirmation. Um, something I haven't mentioned probably, but is worth saying, is you'll notice that each week uh, oscillates between what you would say is confessional Christianity or people within religion and then people who would be outside of it. So week one, Thomas Aquinas within Christianity, within the church. Week two, all the thinkers, I think all the thinkers are outside of religion, would not associate themselves with confessional Christianity. Then week three is lots of people who are, they're all kind of connected and within confessional Christianity. Um, then week, the week after that was people again who are outside of it, uh, you know, from Feuerbach to uh, Sartre to Simone, uh, Simone de Beauvoir. And then in keeping with that structure, uh, this week is people who are within uh, Christianity, right? So uh, we're back with the kind of confessional in the, in the confines of religion. Then next week will be outside of it again. And then the final few days is parotheology. There you go, the pinnacle, the end of history, right? After parotheology, there's nowhere to go. Uh, not at all, but I wanted to finish with parotheology because this is also a really good way of kind of coming to the type of work that we're doing together uh, and that I've been doing for many years. <coughs> so what holds this group of people together that you're going to be uh, encountering this week? Um, well, the first thing to say is all of them take seriously the previous week, and that's the most important thing, is that all of these thinkers are very well read uh, in people like Marx and Feuerbach and Freud, and to a greater or lesser extent, they, are, they would kind of affirm uh, kind of what's, what's going on there, that religion kind of is speaking about ourselves in a loud voice, as Feuerbach says. Um, so all of them... Uh, you know, say maybe the exception of Barnett Newman because he's an artist, but he's very well read. But the others who are academics uh, say are very well read in the religious critique. Not even the religious critique. The whole thing about last week was when we speak about God, we speak about ourselves uh, in a variety of ways. And so, for example, Freud was very sensitive to how whenever individuals um, speak about their beliefs, uh, there is, to a greater or lesser extent, a connection to their own history, their own family, their own fears, their own anxieties, their own wishes, their own delusions. Uh, for Feuerbach, there's something about religion writ large that tells us about our own essence and our own possibilities. Um, for someone like uh, Goldman, Emma Goldman, uh, religion doesn't so much tell us about who we are as individuals or a society, but tells us about current systems and structures, and particularly structures of oppression. Uh, but all of last week was kind of, as I say, the, the kind of 
the rejection of mysticism to the extent that these people were all interested in concrete religion, they find it very profound to, to see in our religious speech a speech that tells us something very insightful about ourselves. So this week, these people, you know, by and large, take that on. And if I was to try to sum up, because I think last week I said this was the functional critique, uh, and I called it the functional or functionalist critique because it was like religion performed a function. And the function was to tell us something about ourselves. In this week, I would say that what unifies everybody is that they're interested in something that is going on in the name God. So it's an, it is a form of theological atheism. They're not so much interested in God. You'll notice that whenever God comes up, they're very like the mystics and, and embrace a type of radical negation. But there's something going on in the name God. So although religion is a human, all too human thing, there's something going on in religion that we can't put our finger on that prevents it from being reduced to a purely imminent reflection of ourselves. So that's probably what connects them. And that means there's a lot of similarity to the mystics, right? But we're moving into the 20th century and there's, there's definitely a continuity with mysticism and there's also a little bit of difference. So I'm going to just briefly go over the different people you're going to encounter this week, say a little bit about each of them. The first person is Karl Barth, and uh, that's an interesting one. I wanted to put Barth in because um, he doesn't fit that neatly in some ways, but because he, he's a very conservative theologian. Um, I would like to do a reading on Bart someday. I need to find a good article, and it's more selfish because I think there's some really good stuff in Bart, and reading it alongside some of you, I think would be really interesting. But one of the things I like about Bart, uh, especially the young Bart, was that he, he wrote this really good article about Feuerbach, and uh, he basically fully embraces it. He says that all religion is ultimately a way of speaking about ourselves. And his critique of religion and Christianity at the time of Nazi Germany was that the church got itself caught up in earthly politics and was able to be manipulated by uh, people in power because there wasn't a radical understanding of this, that all religion uh, is, a, is a speaking of ourselves, right? He, so Barth, especially his epistle to the Romans, was all about what's called crisis theology, spelled with a K. <clears throat> crisis theology is this idea that God is a radical no. God is, God is not that which is contained in religion, but in a sense, that which ruptures religion, that which kind of breaks it open. Now, I like this a lot because I have to say that I have seen some of my friends uh, get caught up in this. And I don't want to get too political here, um, but I do have some friends who, for example, got very caught up in seeing Christianity as very closely connected to the Democrat Party. Now, I, I was in America at the time and I know that a lot of them are reacting to a lot of conservatives who traditionally connected Christianity with the Republican Party, right? So the reaction to that was very much active campaigning for, uh, a few of my friends went on active campaigns with Joe Biden and very much connected Christianity to that. <coughs> and you see this on both sides. You kind of see people who, associate Christ with the Republicans and then there's people who take the piss out of that right and then there's people who associate Jesus with the Democrats and then there's people who kind of take the piss out of that right but we all want to, to associate Jesus with some sort of political party and whatever and Bart Bart is very good at saying that even when you do that for the right reasons it's going to end up bad it's always going to end up bad you're going to be manipulated. You're going to find yourself having to defend things you can't defend. You're going to have to, you're going to find yourself in all sorts of knots. So, you know, for example, 
uh, there was like whenever Biden did many of the same things that Trump did and some of the same policies, um, my friends who were very critical of Trump suddenly were not so critical of Biden, right? There was, there was just even whenever the same things were happening because they got caught up in this. Now, don't hear me as saying you can't have, or Bart as saying you can't have political positions and fight for them and engage with them. Bart would be all for that. I'm all for that. I think it's interesting. But, but Bart was all about going, but don't think for a second that what is going on in the name God is something that can be reducible to any worldview, any ideology. Uh, we're always going to end up with Feuerbach, which is projections, projections of our own history, our own childhood, our own fears, our own hatreds. Um, and and if, if religion has anything to offer, it kind of offers a crisis. <laughs> it offers a no. And uh, I have a little small reading from the Epistle to the Romans that, uh, that Bart, the commentary to the Epistle to the Romans, where Bart takes on this verse which says, you know, we all have the knowledge of God within us. Now, Karl Bart hated natural theology, right? Because for him, natural theology, as soon as you think that you can see God in the world in some sort of way, Bart again says, you're kind of, you're setting yourself up for a fall. So he was very negative about natural theology. And there's a, very, there's a book uh, which is, contains a debate that he had with um, Emile Brunner, a theologian, where they basically go at it like this. Uh, it's a quite an interesting little book if, you're, if, you, if you want to read it. Um, but like Bart is basically going, almost like there's no knowledge of God. So whenever you see this little bit in that book, you're going, well, what's he going to say about this verse that says about the knowledge of God? And so Bart very cleverly talks about how we have a knowledge of God, but the knowledge of God is the knowledge of something that is beyond knowledge. We have within us a sense of there being something that we cannot grasp. We have a type of epistemological humility um, that that's not a knowledge of God as such, but it's kind of an experience of humility, an experience of our limits. And a sense of something beyond all limit. And that's, that's kind of what marks us. So we are marked by a knowledge, but again, in the Bartian sense, it's a, it's a knowledge that is a, is a negation. And you'll hear in that a lot of that mystical kind of language uh, that you, you encountered in the third week. Um, if you're interested in Bart, I couldn't find what I really wanted to show because he had, there's a, there's a, there is a book, um, I think I actually linked to it in the reading, uh, that argues that, you know, what you see in the 20th century is a number of functionalist critiques of religion, and you've seen a few of them now, and there are a few others that I didn't mention, mostly from sociologists, different theories of how religion functions in a very human way. And this writer uh, can, uh, says basically Bart should be associated with those functionalist critics because Bart has a very, um, a very radical critique of religion that's just as radical as all of the others. But for, for Bart, it's a critique um, <coughs> that opens the way up for, for something else. Um, and. Uh, it's a, it's a little excerpt from the Church Dogmatics, but it's been taken out and put into a, relig a book called Religion. So I'd recommend you have a look at that if you're interested in going a bit further with Bart. But he's the first person. Uh, second person you're going to encounter is one of my favourites, Simone Weil. Uh, Simone Weil is a fascinating character. She's absolutely brilliant intellect. Uh, she was studied alongside Sartre and de Beauvoir, and she was known as one of the greatest intellects of her generation in France, but she took a very different direction to most of the French intellectuals, and she got very drawn into a type of mysticism, uh, but also an extreme uh, identification with the poor. Um, she was a resistance fighter. She worked on a factory floor to identify with 
uh, with the proletariat. Uh, she, <coughs> she very much was connected with the people. And she writes in incredibly rich ways. And you're going to get a little reflection from her about the purifying power of atheism. Um, for Vey, um, you don't see this in, in this reflection, but you will see this in one of the last reflections we have. Uh, when I, uh, I, there's a little video that you'll be seeing in a, in a week or two, and I talk about this. But for Simone Vey, there's something in religion, and she was a Catholic, and she found this within Christianity. Um, there's something about God that is a not having, a not getting. There's something about, in a world where we kind of, kind of can have things and we're looking for things and where we can have more and more, uh, Simone Weil says that religion opens up a space of not having. And there's something going on in religion that cannot be grasped. And it's this spatiality, this, uh, this, this thing that we cannot grasp that generates our desire. And so for they, there is within religion, the very human construct of religion, there is an unspeakable core that evokes our desire. And that desire is basically what brings us to life. It's very much, you know, very similar to psychoanalysis and that there's something about desire is central to what it is to be human. And there's something about religion at its best that doesn't give you what you want but very productively doesn't give you what you want. So you could almost say that the purpose of religion is not to give you God. <laughs> um, uh, and in not giving you God, uh, opening up a space for desire and for yearning and for longing and for an enjoyment of that longing. Now connected to that is uh, one of my favorite artists and one of my very favorite pieces of art which you will get after Simone Weil, Barnett Newman. And uh, I'm gonna be showing you a piece of art and I'll be talking a little bit about that on a video. Uh, again, it's a video and, or it's a piece of art that I think captures the idea that something emanates from the modern condition. Something not reducible to imminent reality, not reducible to the material world. So what Barnett Newman does, he was a secular Jew, so he's the only person in this week who's kind of outside of, say, the church. Uh, and his paintings, the Stations of the Cross that you're going to look at, are a kind of memorial to the Holocaust. But they're also paintings that evoke the sense of something that remains uh, in the aftermath of, of suffering something that remains uh, with, that cannot be gotten rid of. And so that kind of connects a lot with the Simone Weil reading that you'll have the day before, because she talks about um, a type of atheism uh, that, that leaves something in place that we cannot grasp. So Newman's work, I think, captures that. And then after Newman, you've got probably the, the richest kind of piece of writing this week uh, by Gabriel Marcel, a French existentialist, French Catholic writer, um, who wrote this very famous essay called, uh, I think it's oh, On the Ontological Mystery. I think that's it, something similar. You're gonna get it anyway. And I'm uh, recommending the first five pages you read. And in that book, uh, Marcel absolutely embraces the human condition and the modern condition. Uh, but in the midst of that says that something shines through. And again, for Marcel, the point of religion is to fully embrace the material world, but to also orient us to something transcendent, something that is not reducible to the material world. <coughs> now, after that, we have, I think, Marion, and we have Tillich. Jean-Luc Marion, I might change this reading, so at the moment you've got it, but it's the most difficult reading, it's only two pages, um, but it is very difficult, or the most philosophical, so if you're going to miss something, you might want to drop that, uh, unless you're interested in philosophy, there's 
Lots of terminology in the two pages. There's references to the philosopher Husserl and Kant, and there's the use of words like phenomenology, intuition and concept and a variety of terms. But actually the way into the piece, and it's from an essay called In the Name, uh, when you're reading it, if you're not used to the philosophical language, the key to, to what he's saying is simply that uh, he uses two terms, intuition and concept. Intuition, you can think of as the experience of the world, right? So you experience things, that's what animals do. We experience the world through our senses. And then concept is our ability to think about what we experience and to categorize it, right? So to be human is to have knowledge and knowledge involves categorization, seeing similarities and differences, right? So we can do that. If uh, Kant famously said that intuition without concepts um, uh, is blind and concepts without intuition are empty. So, you know, if you could have pure intuition with no concept, it's like a blindness. You could experience things, but you could never really know things. And if you have pure concept, but you never experience the world, there's a type of emptiness to that. Now, what Marion says is he says that in the tradition known as phenomenology, uh, philosophers have said that uh, our experience of the world, we experience the world, and our concept of what we experience is often, uh, you know, what could you say? Like, I have a concept of New York, right? I go to New York and I live there and I visit and I learn as much as I can about New York, but I'll never fully know it. I'll never know New York completely. There's always more to learn. So the intuition never fully fills up the concept. Uh, but then also sometimes, the intuition can fill up the concept. If I think of a, a, an app to make for an iPhone, for example, I can have a concept of what it can do. And if I build the app and it works, it kind of does exactly what it's supposed to do. So the concept and the, the intuition kind of fit. Well, then Marion says, what religion talks about is it talks about um, an, an experience that is beyond the concept that the concept cannot grasp. So if you think of religion as a type of concept for a second, you could say that religion is inundated with an experience that it cannot grasp. So you're kind of blinded, but not blinded because of a lack. You're blinded because of an excess, like looking at the sun and going blind. So religion in a way can, is, a human, can be, is a human thing, but is infused or can be infused with something beyond it. Um, and so that's kind of Marion. Uh, and then finally, Paul Tillich. And it's a little bit from Paul Tillich where he's uh, from a book called Ultimate Concern, which is a series of interviews and conversations he had with students. And in that, he just introduces the idea of two types of religion, a narrow religion and uh, a universal religion. So a narrow religion is Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever, secularism. And the, the universal religion is a type of ultimate concern. And for, for Tillich, these are interconnected. But Tillich is saying, that, again, there's something going on in religion. There's something going on in the name God. And for him, it's a type of ultimate concern. It's a type of call to a commitment beyond our self-interest. There's something, there's something in the best of religion that speaks of something ultimate. Um, an example might be an artist can never really paint the sublime. An artist might be interested in trying to capture the very essence of beauty, but they continue to fail. But the failure is driven by the sublime. The very fact that they can never grasp the sublime shows that they're kind of already caught up in it. Or people arguing about the truth and what is true, they can never fully articulate what the truth is, but the whole argument is saturated in a belief in the truth, right? The tr truth is what generates the desired argument. Even if you're arguing against the idea of truth, 
you are trying to argue for something true. Uh, so in, in a way, it's like you're always haunted by what you cannot grasp. And again, this is a type of embrace of religion in its very failure. So just to sum up this week, this is again a form of theological atheism in many ways, in which they embrace the functionalist critiques of religion. Religion is a form of talking about ourselves. Uh, if, if there's something more in religion, it's like you go so deep into it that you encounter something in the midst of it that cannot be reduced to it. That's what these thinkers are interested in. And as I say, Tillich is a good example because he might say that like, truth, you, know, you cannot grasp the truth, but you're grasped by the truth. Or in terms of morality, the law, right? If you're a lawyer, the law is always changing and developing. Every time you try to say what justice is, and this is an example from Derrida, every time you try to write down what justice is, you miss it. It's always changing. You'll always find a condition in that kind of causes you to have to rethink the, the, the way that you thought about justice. So the law is always looking at past cases, past precedent, but also open to new possibilities. But the point is that although the law can never articulate justice, it is driven by justice. It is driven to articulate justice. It's failure to, to actually nail down justice is caught up in uh, the pursuit of the just. So the just is basically haunting the law uh, at its best. At its best, it is haunting, but it can never be grasped. Uh, justice is what is going on in the name law. And in the same way, something is going on in the name God. And these thinkers are articulating that. Now, after this week, we are going to go, is it, we're, we're kind of like the affirmation, negation, and negation of negation are now really intertwined. So this week, atheism and theism are really even more closely intertwined than they were before. And the week after, they're going to be even more closely intertwined. So we're kind of moving out of the each week is a different part of the dialectic. This week is all about kind of articulating different thinkers who really deeply interweave theism and atheism. And next week it's gonna, you know, it's gonna get even closer, even more tightly knit uh, until, until the end, until we get up to Easter, where we see Christ on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me?